It is the case that Islamic metaphysics considers the absolute absolute to be above all constraints and far beyond the ontological principle as it is commonly understood. The divine essence or that al-ilahiyah in Islamic metaphysics is considered transcendence over all restrictions and even the benchmark of being beyond all restrictions, placing it above even being, also known as beyond being or non-being. However, most schools of Islamic thoughts keep using the term wujud when expressing this metaphysical doctrine. Thus, even though Muslim Gnostics and metaphysicians have not restricted metaphysics to ontology and have continued to be fully aware of the supra-ontological nature of the supreme reality, the debate over which of wujud and mahiyah is best remains at the center of Islamic metaphysical thought. Nothing is more essential to Islamic philosophy and particularly its metaphysics than wujud at one's existence and being and how it relates to mahiya, essence slash quiddity. Islamic philosophers, theologians, and even some Sufis have been interested in this topic for centuries. They have built their theories on the study of wujud with views which have occupied Islamic thoughts and greatly influenced Jewish and Christian philosophy. Islamic philosophy is primarily concerned with the concept of wujud and how it differs from mahiyah. Thus, to comprehend the significance of these fundamental ideas, as well as how they differ and relate to one another, is to comprehend the precise foundation of Islamic philosophical thought. Insofar as the study of wujud is concerned, the Quranic teachings about God as the Creator are extremely important to the progress of Islamic philosophy. On the one hand, it placed emphasis on the significance of the ontological gap between wujud and mawjud or being and existence. And on the other, it gave the distinction between the bestowal of wujud upon mahiyah a different significance than that found in the Aristotelian philosophy that emerged amongst the Greeks. A man can pose two questions in an effort to comprehend the nature of the reality he perceives. First, halhua, is it? And second, mahua, what is it? The response to the first query is wujud or its antithesis, non-existence or adam. And to the second is mahia, from the word mahua or mahia, which is its feminine form. Commonly, some terms in Islamic philosophy are made explicit, but in the particular instance of wujud, it is impossible to define it in the sense of definition used in logic, which consists of genus and specific difference. Furthermore, every unknown is defined by that which is known, but nothing is more universally known than wujud, so there is nothing else in terms of which wujud can be defined. It is said that every individual, even a baby, intuitively comprehends the difference between wujud and its opposite. When a baby is crying, indeed talking to her about milk really doesn't help. However, as soon as the baby is given real milk, which is the wujud of milk, the baby ceases crying. Therefore, rather than defining wujud, Muslim philosophers make statements like wujud is that by virtue of which it is possible to give knowledge about something what well, wujud is that which is the source of all effects, to suggest what it means. Mahiyah, on the other hand, can be succinctly and precisely defined as that which answers the question, what is it? Notwithstanding, there has been a further development of this nation in later Islamic philosophy, differentiating between mahiyah in its specific sense, bilma'an al which is the answer to the question, what is it? And mahiyah in its general sense, bilma'an al am which denotes the meaning by which a thing is what it is. Mahiyah is translated by Doshi Hiko Izutsu quite appropriately as essence in its general sense and as quiddity in its specific sense. Mahiyah in its general sense, essence, is allegedly derived from the Arabic expression Mabihi Hua Hua, that by which something is what it is. Unlike the general sense of mahiya, which is opposed to wujud, the specific sense of mahiya, quiddity, refers to the reality of a thing or hakiko. Regarding the etymological term of wujud, it is connected to the root wawjimtar, which has the fundamental meaning to find or to come know about something. It shares etymological roots with the roots wajud, which means ecstasy or bliss, and wujdan, which denotes consciousness, awareness, or knowledge. 
The concept of wujud as it is used in Islamic philosophy cannot be reduced to existence. Instead, it refers to existence, existence, being, and being, each of which is used in the context of Islamic metaphysics to mean something different. Respectively, existence refers to the reality of all things or what is known as possible beings, mumkin or wujud. Well, existence to the first emanation from the pure being, also known as al faitul Aktas, the most holy emanation. The term being refers to the necessary being, multiple wujud, where the term being is a universal concept encompassing all levels of reality, both that of creatures and that of multiple wujud, or the necessary being. The term mawjud or existence, which Islamic philosophy, particularly that of the later period, distinguishable from wujud as the act of existence, is one such term deriving from wujud. Muslim philosophers understood exactly the distinction between mawjud and wujud. With respect to Aristotelian metaphysics, the word of existence in which the existence of something, that something as an existence and unity of the things are all the same, is not the starting point of Islamic ontology. The word could not not exist for Aristotle. Since it is an ontological barrier that cannot possibly be crossed, the distinction between wujud and mahiyah is not particularly important. In contrast, the word is not the same as wujud in Islamic thought. Being that wujud is only given by God, who is the only eternal reality, there is an ontological poverty of the word, and hence all other existence come into being and passing away due to the eternal reality. Thus, the conceptual difference between wujud and mahiyah acquires great significance and, far from being unimportant, turns into the essential elements for comprehending the nature of reality. Muslim philosophers assert that the intellect has the ability to clearly distinguish between the wujud and mahiyah of everything, not in the external world where there is only one existing object, but rather in the container of the mind. Man's response to the question, what is it? in regards to a particular object is entirely unrelated to his concern for the object's existence or non-existence. The mind has the capacity to imagine something's quiddity, let's say that of a man, as being entirely distinct from all other forms of wujud and pure and complete as mahiyah. As a result, mahiyah is referred to in Islamic philosophy as natural universal, following Ibn Sina's terminology. Mahiyah is thus considered in itself and insofar as it is itself. Mahiyah can also manifest in the mind where it has mental existence and in the outside world where it has external existence. But it can also be completely imagined independently of virtue, as when the mind imagines the mahiya of man, which includes the definition of man without taking into account whether or not man exists. Therefore, wujud must be added to a mahiya or become wedded to it from outside itself in order for a mahiya to exist. There have been many misconceptions about this distinction and the connection between wujud and mahiya throughout the history of Islamic thought. Therefore, even though some philosophers have referred to existence as combined paths, it is crucial to stress that Ibn Sina and his circles didn't start out with two realities, one mahiyah and the other wujud, that became wedded in concrete external objects. Instead, they started with the mawjud, which they analyzed in their philosophical treatises, a single concrete external object. However, these concepts were to serve as a key to understanding not only the relationship between suchness and isness of existence, but also the ontological origin of things and their interrelatedness, as we will see in Mulasatra's Transcendence Philosophy. By the way, you can support this channel by donating via PayPal, and the link is on the description below. Thank you so much. See you next time.